each introduce yourself, starting with you, Donna. Uh, hello, I'm Donna Jordan. <laughs> and hi, I'm Brad Stein. And you both have been, tell me a little bit about your public service in a couple sentences. Um, <laughs> well, I get public service. I spent 16 years on the city council starting in 1990 and um, happily retiring in 2016. 2006, <laughs> it looks like Brad will make it to 2016. <laughs> and um, I had two terms as uh, the mayor, was very honored by that. Enjoyed all of the time and uh, also was happy to move into retirement. And you, Brad? I was sorry that Donna moved into retirement, <laughs> and I've been on the city council, started at the same time with Donna, uh, 1990, and I'm still currently on the city council. Um, I've been honored to be mayor three times now also, uh, and it was, uh, it, it's been a terrific experience, and I think anyone who lives and cares about the community should be on the city council or work within the city and whether they volunteer for an organization or, or uh, volunteer for a board, just get involved. It's our community, so I well, finally yeah. believe that. Well, let's start off with why you two both ran. We'll start with Donna and then go okay. to you, Brad. Uh, so Donna, tell me, what was going on at the time? How were you enlisted to run? And, uh, and tell me about the issues and the campaign. Okay, that's a big question. Uh, so go ahead, Donna. Yes, uh, you know, in 1990, that uh, time of the community, there were uh, a lot of issues that had to do with development. And I got involved starting about 1988, I think, going to the Bluffs meetings. And uh, that was one of the, the big issues of that time. But there was also kind of a, a disconnect between the, the council and the people that you could feel. In fact, mm -hmm. when Brad ran in 1988 and came very, very close to unseating an incumbent who was spending lots and lots of money uh, defending his seat, there was a letter written to the paper that I remember really clearly that said, Brad, you actually won. You didn't lose that election because you brought out these issues and you got all of the people really concerned and uh, expressing themselves that they were looking for some kind of a change. And then in the spring of 1990, the council put on the ballot a redevelopment agency. It was Measure M, I think they called it, and asked the community to vote on that. And there was a lot of concern that that was another step toward big development, bringing in big developers. And uh, the, the merchants downtown were very much against it. I got involved in that campaign. I met um, Mike Ledbetter in that campaign. And in June, when the, uh, the balloting was done, Measure M went down 80%, actually it was 79% to 21%. It was, it was a big, big defeat. And four-fifths of the council had supported it. So when four-fifths of the people <laughs> vote against something that four-fifths of the council uh, supported, you knew that there was something that was disconnected. And it uh, was... Who was on the council then? And I'll go to Brad here for a minute. Well, yeah. at that time, it was uh, Mayor Tom Lewis. There was uh, Carmen Robitaille. There was uh, David Lawrence. <laughs> there was Mark King. And there was Ernie Wolbrandt. Those were the seated council members there. And Ernie Wolbrandt was the uh, lone no vote on the Major M yes. campaign. And, and along with that disconnect, I, it, it's, I mean, all the people on that city council at that time were really, they had the community at heart. They thought they knew the direction they were going in. And they did, I uh, thought they were doing the right thing at, with the tools that they had. But unfortunately, like Donna mentioned, when you're in a, a community like this, kind of isolated from the rest of the, uh, the world, so to speak, um, I think that they lost really sight of what we had here in Carpinteria, where I think that the 80% saw what was happening to all the communities south of us and to the north of us. Uh, especially the beach communities being exploited and overdeveloped. And with all that, yes, you do increase property tax money, you come in, but with that, 
you get a lot of downside. There's a lot of uh, drawbacks that they forgot why we live here, what makes carpentry special. And I think... Uh, so, so what were some it? of the other issues that you both ran? Well, one was a budget issue as well at that time. Now, the city had had the local coastal plan, and we were looking at... Uh, hold on one second. So, you were saying? I think that the budget issue was one of them. Uh, I remember at that time, Alan Coates, uh, after we were reelected, that you needed to have all this development to keep balancing your budget. Mm -hmm. And I know that the three of us, when we were elected, we saw things a little differently. Maybe we weren't looking and handling the budget the way it should be. Um, and because if you try and build your way out of a budget, it's just a pyramid scheme. You'll never catch up because then you have mm -hmm. to continue, continually perpetuate that. We could see that in uh, a lot of the towns in the Central Valley. And in fact, Oxnard was mm -hmm. in a, everybody was in a big development mode at that time. And they kept losing money. And mm -hmm. I remember Oxnard had to close a uh, fire, station, fire station, and they were all in, in serious trouble. And CARP was, uh, was not a wealthy community, and the budget was not healthy at that time. I remember I still actually have the last um, staff report from before the, when the city manager who was in there when we were, came in left, and it basically said the city will be out of money by a year from June, which would have been June 91, and there was nothing left in the reserve fund, and you'll either have to raise taxes or cut services severely. And that's kind of what we were facing. And yet, after a couple of years of bringing in a, a manager whose strength was uh, budgeting, we began to build up the reserves. I think they went as high as $5 million, mm -hmm. and the city had enough money put away to weather this recent downturn oh, and so do very, very well. How, how mm -hmm. were things changed in order to save money and not go through so much money? Well, one of the things we looked at as well is we tended to be with the same franchises, the same trash hauler at the time. We looked at, at Inevitably, a small community with the uh, restrictions that the state and the federal government puts on you, you have to have a certain size police force. That was becoming a real money pit, and we kind of saw that happening too. That's when we started looking at the, the idea of contracting with the sheriff's department. And at the time also, uh, I mean, that was just one of the, the issues. Because it, even to this day, uh, a large portion of our budget is the sheriff's contract, where back then we were being faced with an exorbitant cost, uh, not only with workman's comp claims and retirement, but new police cars, new, new uh, radio systems, new everything. And Again, when you hire professional officers, there's only so much room for advancement. So we would pay to have somebody trained to come here and they would stay their mandatory uh, uh, year and then move on to a larger department where they could advance. And this is something really special. I'm gonna break right now because look at the rain. We haven't seen this in a oh, long, long look time. Look at Larry. that, oh my gosh. Well, it is actually raining outside. <laughs> This that hurts my son Kevin with a hose. I can't tell, but no, this is a, this is so welcome. Yeah. Wow. Sorry, Larry. I just had to do that. Right? <laughs> that was great. That was great. So, uh, yes. any other ways that come to mind the money was saved? Yes, you know the the city's main sources of money are property tax, sales tax, uh, TOT. Believe it or not, mm -hmm. the the bed tax. And um, I think some of the things that happened, for instance, the whole revitalization of the downtown area was to build up so people would stay in town and spend their money here. And I think that worked very, very well. There was some criticism at the time. Um, Linden Avenue was dead. There was, it was somewhere around 55% vacant. And um, it took a number of years to go down and do that revitalization and change things. But we knew that by making it a desirable place, businesses would come, and they and they do. I mean, we get vacancies now, and then um, and there's always someone coming in with a new idea and wanting to to go into business there. Uh, so that I think was was extremely helpful. 
and uh, another thing so, was the... So, so there was a revitalization <laughs> of downtown to help bring more money to the city. To help, well, to make, to make I think, more inviting. From, my, from my point of view anyway, it was always a matter of quality of life mm -hmm. and making the community better for the people who lived here. And the fact that it also brought more interest in the community and business into the community and new businesses to you know, sell things to people who lived here, that was a, that was a bonus. Uh, also along with that too, and again, that kind of feeds on revitalizing the, revitalizing the downtown, um, the redevelopment agency that was being looked at, that was gonna change the entire look of the Linden T all the way down through into the beach area. The vision at that time were lots of hotels down in the beach area, uh, Linden Avenue was going to be completely redone, so you might get you might get something like the Third Street Promenade in Santa Monica versus what we have here now, just a quaint town. Um, and with that redevelopment agency, there are a lot of costs, and we've seen other communities that have put together an RDA where you have to have a separate board that runs it, and they're they're very expensive. And by revitalizing it the way we did, we took I think it was six years. And it was, had, yeah, it was three different phases. And I remember we had that. The whole yeah. community, we had a lot of community workshops. Everything was involving the community. Uh, and so we took monies that we had available and spread it out over six years to do that. We did a block at a time. I remember that. Well, was the council before you uh, developing a, a redevelopment agency? That's what they were looking at with Major M. That was well, that would be Major the whole M point. would have done that. Yeah. Yes, Major M would have done that. And the idea behind it is you get lots of money up front, you borrow, and then you have 40, I think it was 40 years to pay it back. It's, it's a, a long-term scheme. <laughs> and it also changes, yeah. it changes the... Again, the the uh, the community itself usually puts brings in big developers mm -hmm. rather than having the the mom and pop places that we prefer yeah. to see down there. So. What were some of the uh, specific things going on around town that you you disagreed with or that you changed? I think one thing I heard of is the tilt ups at the west end of town. <laughs> that was not us. That was the <laughs> previous. Yeah. But that, was that an example of? you gave of what was inappropriate or? Poor planning, I think it is. Uh, poor planning where you put the residential actually across next to the freeway and you put the tilt-ups on the marsh side where they, you know, the more beautiful scenery and uh, views. I think that was uh, kind of one of the planning issues. There, there were a number of things that came in. I think the city was in the throes of, of what many small towns do, which is develop in order to get the development fees. Mm -hmm. And there wasn't a feeling that you could control it. It was just one of those things that was going to happen. And I remember people saying, um, we'd see it in the, the newspaper, which was the Herald at that time. They were very pro-development. You know, you must develop or die. Uh, growth is good, those kinds of things. And we were accused often of being no growthers, which was never true. It was more of, you know, we can as a community say how our community is going to go forward. That's, that's a power we have as a community. I think that's one of the things I'm proudest of, mm -hmm. of the uh, councils that we were on, is that we said to people, you're in charge here. It isn't the developers. Yeah. It's, it's not going to just happen. This is something you can plan for yourself, for your community. And, um, and I think that's happened. And I think that's now part of our community psyche is that mm -hmm. now we feel like we're in control and when somebody comes in from outside or even within with uh, something that doesn't fit they're they're told to skedaddle yeah could you um each weigh in on the visioning process what that was mm -hmm. and uh donna why don't you go first um, yes, that was uh, when Samantha Orduno came in as mm -hmm. city manager. She actually brought that idea because <laughs> council expresses usually the, the general direction they'd like to go, and it's up to the city manager to take that and focus it and, and make action out of it. So I think she did a very good job in, in proposing that we go through a community visioning process, which would bring in those who wanted to participate, and we tried to get as many people as possible, I think. About 150 oh. finally showed oh, yeah. up to be on yeah, the visioning uh, committees. And they were instructed to sit down. They met over a period of about a year uh, and, and 
the categories or different areas that we were interested in, you know, transportation and housing and the arts and the, the different you know, categories that they looked at. And then each one of those committees came in with suggestions and pretty, in pretty much detail, I'll have to say, that was presented to the council and, and presented back out to the community in a, a booklet that was called Visioning 2020. And I do understand mm -hmm. they might be talking about doing it again. It's uh, for some reason that 20 years has blown by. And we're trying <laughs> yes. to look now at 2040, uh, starting it up again. Um, now, what, whether we'll do it the same way or not, uh, we might look at a different way to involve even mm -hmm. more people. Brad, uh, was the bluffs, uh, buying the bluffs, partly a result of the visioning process? Or what was going on before then? Well, I think that was always part of the vision. Um, whether that specific item was in the visioning process, I know that one of the ideas was to acquire the bluffs ultimately and keep it open. But also along with that was, do we want to expand our downtown area? We already had Shepherd Place uh, uh, Shopping Center, we had uh, Casitas Plaza. Are we going to add another one out in the East Valley area or another one over in the West Valley area? And, you know, that came back loud and clear. No, no, we want to focus on what we have here because when you start satelliting that out, the next thing to, to go is everything around it. You have to start developing around it. And the boulevards, I, I remember El Carroll Lane was going to end up going all the way through. That was one of the scariest things that uh, I remember seeing yes. shortly after coming on the council mm -hmm. is we looked at the general plan, which right. has all of those different elements in it. And one of them is called the circulation element. And I, I don't know that there was specific planning that it, they wanted it to happen, or they were just saying, eventually we're going to be growing out the whole valley, therefore we'd better get ready for it. And they had boulevards going all the way to the west end of the valley, and they had um, Baylord going all the way through to 192. You could look at that and in an instant realize that the city was going toward this humongous expansion and it was just going to be allowed to happen. And that's, that's mm -hmm. I think, what we said no. And we had help. And, yeah. you, and, you, and I think this is a really, really important thing. There was the Coastal Act. Yes. That was one of the best things that's ever happened to this valley. Well, what was that? The Coastal Act? The Coastal Act was 19, through, I want to say... 70s? Um, 79. It might have been 79. 90, yeah, it was a, a, a ballot measure in, the, in California yeah. that um, was to protect the coast from overdevelopment and to set standards and, and open areas and public access and all of that kind of stuff. And right after that passed, they began to do, they began to implement it by having local coastal commissions. And we had Naomi Schwartz on mm -hmm. our local coastal commission. And I think she's the one more than anyone that helped set the, the line for where the coastal district would be here. And, and usually it goes along the first highway you come to, which probably would have been 101. She pushed it all the way to the top of the first ridge, yeah. meaning the entire Carpentria Valley is in the coastal zone. That that's, that has not happened anywhere else in California. And it stood, stood the test of time. And what it meant was that the whole valley was protected by the uh, protections that are in the coastal zone. So for instance, agriculture is a very high priority in the coastal zone. And so agriculture was protected. Um, housing was a low priority. And so the, the city basically was not going to be able to push out into those areas anymore because to do so you would have required the Coastal Commission's approval, which we do for mm -hmm. all major developments, and it wouldn't have been forthcoming. So that, that more than anything I can think of was really a help um, toward keeping this valley the way it is now and keeping the agriculture in the valley. Yeah. You know, the Coastal, Coastal Act, we're lucky to have that in place. Um, it's not to say you are not going to have development, but it does add an extra layer that the local community has more weight in what does happen and transpire here. I mean, we've seen where the Coastal Act has been kind of worked up and down the coast, but it still comes back to the local area for a lot of the decisions that are made. 
So it's been real helpful for us. As long as you have a strong, again, city council who has the vision that this is what we want to see happen here. Uh, let's switch to oil, if we may. Um, what what is there's something of a history of oil in the valley, and what were some of the issues that have come up during your times to do with oil and how that was dealt with? And why don't we start with grass? Okay, <laughs> I uh, I still don't shop at Standard Oil or Chevron. Uh, well, one of the the, the issues with oil, uh, I mean, the whole coast in this area. Uh, I'd say from Gaviota all the way down through into Ventura. If you look at old pictures, there were nothing but derricks everywhere. Um, even the Summerland. Even, oh, Summerland. Even <laughs> yeah. piers out into the uh, the low tide zones. Um, gosh, uh, Southern Pacific Railroad built a line right down to Carpinteria to get tar from the tar pits. And that's where they used to mine that back in the 1800s, late 1800s. Um, but oil's always been a big industry here. And, you know, again, like everything else, it's evolving. And where a lot of people worked for the local oil industry here, Chevron was the, the primary. Uh, then they contracted out, or not contracted out, but smaller companies had oil wells off the coast here that they would service uh, off of the local pier here. Um, but oil, it's always been a major business here. Now, with times evolving, it's become smaller and smaller and smaller, and the larger companies like Exxon and Chevron have sold out to smaller companies that can still squeeze out a profit, like Vinico or um, uh, Gecko, Gecko, Greco, oh, up in yeah. uh, up north there. Um, well, what did Vinico propose, and can you tell briefly that story? The, the latest uh, was a, the slant, the slant yeah. drilling. Yeah. yeah, they were talking about putting in a, a slant drilling rig right there in there where the refinery is on shore. Uh, that would have also kind of changed the landscape here in the community. And that, that's still on the table here. I mean, they're still looking at some type of drilling rig there. Well, what would have been the pros and cons? Pros and cons of that? Well, noise site uh, again pollution look at our groundwater what could happen to our groundwater it's so precious now um, spills um, all that will be addressed uh, we have an EIR that's been pulled off the table but all that will be addressed if and when they come back again now the price of oil is going up so <laughs> since they've pulled it back off the table when the price of oil was down um, I expect it to come back again to the community so Donna, can you tell me a little bit about uh, the Benico initiative and so forth? You mean you're looking for a little history on that yeah, or just... Yeah. Well, uh, I, I, <laughs> yeah. I, I want to, for the viewers that don't know anything that yeah. happened with, with the initiative, what, <laughs> what happened? Well, Benico, of course, came in after Chevron. Um, and that, that's an interesting story, too, mm -hmm. because we actually knew Chevron was going to be uh, departing and had started planning for that parcel for the redevelopment of that parcel into something else. And, uh, and then Benico came in and, and bought that up. So um, I think a lot of the concerns were the fact that it's a very, very old facility that's there behind City Hall now. It's been there since before incorporation mm. and uh, has Mid not seen a lot of upgrading in the time that, uh, you know, in the last 20, 30 years. Um, so I think the community has kind of looked we had that, that little time of saying, oh, we're going to be able to do something else with this property. And then that was whisked away for a while. But I think it gave us a taste for realizing that sometime the oil is going to be gone from here. And the unfortunate thing is that, that um, uh, Benico's idea, of course, is to expand. If they did begin to drill, it would be another 20 or 30 years of, of activity down there. And activity that, to me, is just not appropriate in a, a coastal uh, area like that, and certainly not that close to homes, and, and uh, right behind City Hall, and right above the Seal Sanctuary. There's there's so many things that are just not, to me, right about that. And I'm not anti-oil, but I am I'm very much set against that happening here in our community. Um, as you may recall, they came in with a <clears throat> proposal. It 
was not receiving a great deal of favor from the council. And so Venico decided to uh, put it on the ballot as an initiative. Um, they, they called it a citizen initiative because mm. they got two or three citizens to, to sign for it. But it was clearly their initiative. And they spent a great deal of money uh, pushing it and hoping that it would go through. And um, it did not, as you recall. It went down <clears throat> hugely, yes. 70, 30 percent. And some of that was, was simply because people were offended at the fact that they tried to go around the planning process within the city. Because I think Carpenterians do value that process. It's, it's again, it's back to that we have some control over our future through the, the processes that are mm -hmm. set up uh, at, at the city. So when Benico went around that, I think that was at least part of the motivation uh, that people said, no way, you know, go through the process and, and, uh, and see what happens there. So that's, that's where they are now. They're yeah. back to looking at that process. Yeah. <laughs> so housing, who would like to weigh in first? <laughs> I, I, yeah, ahead. I will. I, you know, I, I think Carpinteria has done a really good job of addressing the, particularly the affordable housing issue. And uh, we do get pushed a little bit from the state, I will admit to that, um, and not having redevelopment money, which some cities have had and used for housing. Um, we have partnered with uh, People's Self-Help Housing, which is a fabulous group that comes down and is magically able to raise money. They, they must have a real in with the feds and, and uh, the state. But they've brought into the community uh, several really, really good developments. Dahlia Court is one that they, where they took over a rundown housing development and turned it into really a primo uh, mm -hmm. place to live and then have added on to that the, the camper park out on Villarreal, which was a disaster oh. of, of just awful proportions for so many years and, and such a headache for the police and for code enforcement and everything else. And they are you know, about to open uh, that project, which has replaced that. Uh, well, Casa, de, Casa de la Flores. Uh -huh. And it's, it's I, I'm glad you said it because again, the redevelopment money that we weren't gonna get because of the, it's all population based. We were able to, I think, get even more housing, low income and affordable through partnering with people self-help. And that's always the, the kind of the, the misnomer too is, oh, if you don't keep expanding, you're not going to get these CDBG monies. Uh, you're not going to be getting all these other funds for that kind of housing. But we found ways of doing it without having to trade off what our community is about. And I think you're right, Donna. The, the balance here is perfect right now with the, the type of mm -hmm. housing we have. Um, we've got senior housing and we constantly are, are battling and protecting that. That's a lot of our mobile home parks, uh, yes. our senior housing. That's a big deal. And uh, again, the, uh, we're always under the, the threat. Cart Maria, in fact, Donna, you and I and Mike were on the city council. Mm -hmm. We defended our our uh, rent control ordinance with the, the mobile home parks all the way to the Supreme Court. And that was actually a very big issue at that time because everybody in the country was looking at Carpinteria. What, what was that issue? It, it was the, the, the city of Carpinteria versus, I can't think of the guy's name. Um, uh, but was it, it Pepper? Or I can't remember the sp sp specific one either. It, again, yeah. we're going back 25 yeah. years, so you're testing our memory. <laughs> but that particular item, they were suing the city because we had, we put together, or we as a uh, council didn't, but we had some great folks that lived in the parks that worked on putting together a rent stabilization ordinance for the mobile home parks. And because that was our senior housing and the park owners themselves are constantly going after cities that have these rent freezes for seniors or these parks and uh, trying to, to get them abolished so that they can, at will, raise the prices. Uh, and unfortunately, if you're living there, you can't just pick up your coach <laughs> and move it. And they knew it, you, they had a captive audience. So uh, it, it, it cost the, the community quite a bit of money, but in return, we preserved all that housing. So. Uh, and what, what was the issue, whether uh, 
uh, getting rid of rent control for the, the uh, mobile home parks. Well, whether the city could get rid of it? No, whether the owners could uh, oh, yeah. get rid of it. They didn't have to adhere to the rules. And, and was it a so. city rule, the rent control? Yes. Uh -huh. Yes. So it was Mark Barish, Wally Wills, um, gosh, Bob Hamer. There was one other gentleman that helped write that. Uh, what year that. was yeah. that that the Supreme Court decided that? In the early, in 90s. early 90s, yeah, in, that would yeah, be yeah. safe. Yeah, okay. Because it would be one of the first big tests that we had as a, as a newly elected council. Mm -hmm. Do we go forward and protect this, or do we say, oh, forget it, the lawyers are going to sue us to oblivion. And we said, no, this is important to the community. We'll protect it. So we you know, did. that's a good lesson to a general lesson that um, we went through a number of lawsuits. Yes, we did. And it, it is really important, I hope, that the message gets out or has gotten out to the community that anybody can sue, anybody can stand up yeah. and threaten suits, um, but that if, if you're cautious, you have a good lawyer, mm -hmm. and you follow advice, lawsuits are not something to be afraid of, and you sure don't want to have your city just buckle under and give in to anybody that stands up and, and brings the lawyers along. So I don't know any that we've lost, and, and the city has prevailed no, in, in a number of lawsuits that people you know, were very worried about, very upset about, and, mm -hmm. um, but we had, we had good legal advice saying, no, you're okay, you're, you know, let's carry this forward. And so uh, fingers crossed, but um, yeah. it's, it's it was a good lesson, I think, for us to learn because too many small communities get pushed around by the yeah. people with their lawyers. Yeah, that's why I don't go to Shell and Gas anymore. <laughs> they sued me. Uh, who sued you, Brad? Huh? Mm -hmm. Oh, Chevron and Serena Sued Brown. him personally. Yeah, for mm -hmm. I was the swing mm -hmm. vote on the Bluffs mm -hmm. decision after we got elected, and we had one or two meetings to make a decision before it had, was forwarded to the Coastal Commission. And every meeting that it came to, there were a bank of lawyers uh, for Chevron Land and Development and Serena Brown. And they would step up and hand the city a half inch of legal reasons why I could not vote on the project. There, at that time, our, our council was split two to two. And so, our attorney, uh, city attorney said, okay, we'll have to take this under advisement. We'll re come back next meeting. And that went on for two meetings. And uh, they were trying to buy time to have a newly elected council <laughs> seat, I believe it was, to get another well, vote. No, they, that, when they came after you, it was the second planning. The second. Yeah, the second plan that went through. Yeah. <clears throat> Because we had we had three votes at the beginning. Yeah. We had four at votes the actually yeah, in the council, true. but it was this, the yeah. second iteration of the yeah, bluffs plan years. that they wanted you out of, and yeah. um, so they they and the unfortunate thing was that Brad could not use the city lawyer to defend him. He had to defend yeah. himself, yeah. and um, so it was a big deal. We all went to court that day. I remember yeah. that, and um, that was a long day. <clears throat> it was a long day, yeah. but like fifty million dollars. So. <laughs> he. Uh, came out victorious. Well, yeah. did, did you get some help with the legal bills? <laughs> I did. You know what? I had a, a, a friend of ours um, recommended somebody very good in constitutional law, and she helped me with this uh, quite a bit. And then we had a fundraiser, and, and uh, you know, I had, had a lot of folks come from the community help pitch in. So, you know, it was, it was okay. It was worth it, though, you know, it, in the end, because, again, what Donna was saying and what I've always taught my sons is, you know, if you, you're right, you do your due diligence, uh, and it's what the community is, is after, you know, you should not be bullied. And the threat was you'll either not vote or we're going to sue you. That was it. it you were, it was, you are being held hostage. So uh, Who was on the council at that time? I want to say there was Mark Martinez and Sandy Cajero. Sandy Cajero, I, I think Gary. I think you, Gary was myself, on it that time. Gary Nielsen, yeah. And it, Mark Martinez, yeah. Because it was at that time we, Don and I, were the only ones on there. Yeah. If I remember, because we were the minority vote, and uh, even two of the council members suggested to me I got into this mess. I shouldn't have voted. So you're on your own, kind of thing, and. I just thought that's wrong. That's where I ended up hiring my own attorney, and she ended up coming back and 
them. So it all worked out in the wash. But we did spend a long day in court. I'll tell you. <laughs> we did. Judge threw it out. Yeah, Judge Gordon. Yeah. I he did, he that just day. said, "Go away. Yeah. This isn't a case." Um, yeah. <laughs> um, so let's get back to housing. There have been some times when there's been overcrowded housing. Uh, tell me about that. Oh. Well, we've had, that's always been an issue here. Again, it's an agricultural community. Uh, we had a few people who liked to exploit that aspect of agriculture, and they would move 20, 30, 40 people into a house. Um, and unfortunately, in the early stages, the city could come in and look at code violations. But then our abilities were kind of trumped when the state came back and said you can't regulate the number of people in a certain house. So people self-help housing came in. Uh, they helped us out, alleviate a lot of the problems. And it got to the point where we did take a pretty big step on inspecting rental units mm -hmm. throughout the community. Mm -hmm. And so we were able to go after some folks for code violations to put, a, put the stop to that. I think we were so. things too. We put a, uh, an ordinance through about one kitchen per house because right. people were coming in and adding second kitchens and um, uh, no more garage conversions. Yeah, that, that was an attempt it. to stop those being turned into second housing units. Um, so there were three or four things that gave pay the tools for parking. <laughs> right, that gave tools to the uh, code enforcement people. Because that there was a very, very tough time there, I remember, mm -hmm. for a number of months, maybe a year or more, where Was that in the two thousands? No, that was back in the in the nineties also, where we were getting a lot of complaints from people saying that their neighborhoods were simply being degraded. And uh, I, I remember one letter I got from someone saying I live on a cul-de-sac and I can't even get into my home anymore. And I wake up in the morning and there's there, you know there are people everywhere and there's there's diapers coming over the you know the bushes and you know this is just not I, I've lived here all my life and and we're going to have to move. And it just it really tore at me thinking we got to do something about this. It is just uh, well, wasn't healthy for the people living thirty in a house either. Why do you think it's not happening as much now? A, a lot of it was just simply the city saying they weren't going to allow it anymore, and the word got out that there, there was going to be code enforcement. And as Brad mentioned, each time a house would sell, there's inspection on sale now, so people go in and find things that have been done illegally. They have to be fixed. Mm -hmm. And um, and I think the, the fact that there has been some additional housing out there specifically for the lower income people, people that need you know, needed housing, mm -hmm. couldn't afford it on the market here. Yeah, it was not available to them. And, and again, like you said, I'll give a lot of credit to uh, uh, people's self-help. I mean, what they develop now, you'll see Dahlia Quarter, Costa yeah. Flores. Believe it or not, it's the same number of people, but look where they're living. It's such a much nicer atmosphere for their kids and, and families. That was the other thing. Instead of, of of thirty, you know, single men coming in for a season, or you know, this is just a, a kind of a flop house. Now we're bringing in families that actually are are working in the agricultural business, and and also I will say that business as well uh, uh, has evolved too over the last twenty years. It's becoming more automated, which means fewer employees. So, I mean, where I work down in Oxnard and Camarillo area, there are still areas of housing that you see that, but there's a lot more um, hands-on labor. You know, you need a lot more people to do that kind of uh, work, so. Um, now that we're talking about ag, there's been the issue of uh, greenhouses um, and people being <laughs> against greenhouse development. Mm -hmm. um, I believe both of you have weighed in on not wanting much greenhouse development. Tell, tell me about what's happened with that. Yeah, I don't think it's an anti-greenhouse thing. I think it's more that, again, during the, that period of the early 90s, late 80s, early 90s, there was development going on all over the place. And one of the areas of development was in the greenhouses. They were popping up very quickly. 
And I think the city began to realize that there were impacts that came back upon the city, even though the <coughs> greenhouses are not in the city, they're all in the county uh, ag zones. Uh, but we were beginning to see and get complaints from people about the big trucks coming mm -hmm. through the neighborhoods. The overcrowding was one of the issues. Uh, they were just... Um, the noise. Yeah, I think one of the things, you know, Carp Valley has some of the best uh, soil that there is anywhere for growing. Soil and climate. For and climate. And what we were seeing was the, the soil not being useful or used for the greenhouses. It was either being compacted so that they could put down, you know, the cement floors or in some cases completely being scraped away. And we were hearing from a lot of the, uh, what we call open field people, the avocado growers and so on, that this was not something they were very happy about either. It was changing the whole nature of ag in the, in the valley. And interestingly enough, it was the Carpentria Valley Association that's, that actually took the first action. Um, one of the problems was that many of these greenhouses were going up with no permits. There, there wasn't anybody really watching from the county. There wasn't a real uh, penalty for it. And so the people building them just were skipping the, the planning process. And that meant really building large, and, and they were going up very quickly. So the, uh, the Carpentry Valley Association took one of the developments to the Coastal Commission and uh, asked that it be stopped. And the city decided at that time that we would support that. And we went to the Coastal Commission in support of their petition. And it, was, um, it wasn't granted specifically in that project, but the Coastal Commission wrote a very strong letter to the county letting them know that it was time for them to get control over this whole issue, uh, particularly the illegally, illegal ones that hadn't been permitted, and to uh, to determine the carrying capacity of the valley for future greenhouses and then to do something. And, and that's what finally happened is that the, uh, the county decided to do a planning element for specific to greenhouses in the Carpentaria Valley and not to stop them, but to say where they would be appropriate, where future ones would be appropriate and where they would not be appropriate and make sure that they would get permitted um, and, and with certain restrictions about setback and, and lot coverage and those kinds of things, which you expect in you know, a planning document. And it was, it was a tough time because there were people you know, saying, well, you're, you don't like greenhouses, you're anti-greenhouse, whatever. Um, we weren't, but we were seeing those effects coming back uh, on the city and needed to, to protect the city. That was our job. And uh, I think in the end, it all has, uh, has worked out pretty well. Things have calmed mm -hmm. down. Uh, there is some growth going on in that industry. But I also I think that it helped to save the, uh, the open field ag that we value. Um, I agree. But, but I will say, let me add to that, too. Uh, it, the fight isn't over yet. And it's going to start changing it's, the way it looks. Uh, one of the things along what Donna was saying when they started developing this, and I heard a, um, an owner of, of quite a few greenhouses tell me, well, the next, you know, the natural progression is to take those out and start developing houses after that. Mm -hmm. Because again, when you start putting these, the, the greenhouses in some of the greatest soil on earth and climate, you can put it anywhere. Put greenhouses and grow anything you want. and I. I just heard somebody uh, about a month ago say, you know, isn't it sad that Carp Gria couldn't be like Oxnard? There's a 40 acre greenhouse project that just went in there. And you talk about some of the richest soil and I can see it, see that project when I turn at Emma Wood down, down going to Ventura. And this is down off of Las Posas Road, this project. I can see the light in the morning. I leave at four in the morning to go to work. And I can see the glow from this, you know, 15 miles away. Um, it's, it's, greenhouses had a place here in the valley, but not to cover the entire valley. If that were the case, then why not yeah. develop the whole thing into tilt up concrete buildings or, or uh, housing? Mm -hmm. This is not the place for it. Uh, one grower said that, um there was kind of a, uh, well, <laughs> that 
some of the environmentalists said the greenhouses are bad for the environment and use bad environmental practices and that according to them this was studied and, and nothing actually could be found that they did that was bad environmentally. Any thoughts about that? You, you know, I think that um, the, the better, the best of the greenhouse growers probably are doing an outstanding job yes. environmentally. But it's also taken a number of years to get there and there's been some prodding because there were problems with uh, runoff for a long time into the salt marsh uh, of nutrients and those kinds of things that were traced back to the greenhouses and to just you know dumping of water that just had stuff in it that you didn't want to have in the marsh. So there were um, county enforcement on that. There were groups that got together to try to protect the watershed. And I think what finally happened is that common sense kind of <laughs> won the day and that people sitting down and talking to each other and saying, you know what, you need to do a better job. And the growers saying, yes, OK, we recognize we do need to do a better job, that they have, have made a lot of changes that have been positive. I don't know that all of them have, but I think today I rarely hear complaints about you know, those kinds of practices that we were seeing 25 years ago. Well, you see in the night sky, there's a particular grower up in the foothills that runs lots of lights all night long. And they've been chastised by the county. Uh, and that was the point I was trying to make down mm -hmm. about the Oxnard area. The night sky, you know, when you do a development now, I mean, our new football stadium, you had to have special lighting that would help protect the night light. Um, there are some people that do do a fine job environmentally, but there are others that just don't care and they think it's their right. So, um, again, I think that's going to be an issue. And now there's some of the same folks are looking at providing housing on these pro uh, parcels and to what degree and numbers, we're still waiting on that. Um, there's a well, well, you, loophole. You, you want the growers to provide housing, don't you? Or? Well, do you want to take the valley where you have uh, open field farming and start building housing on it? That kind of circumvents the planning process. Once again, the impacts that it's not held right to that parcel. We're going to feel the impacts here in the community. So now you start building hodgepodge developments. I'm seeing tilt up concrete buildings out here trucking outfits, we're going back, I think we're going back in time now. Poor planning, why would you have these huge buildings being built back here when you've got a commercial area that could have the distribution so you don't have the large semi-trucks coming off the freeway, driving through residential neighborhoods. Um, again, it's, uh, there are some people that are concerned with the valley that do have greenhouses and then there are others that exploit, in my opinion. So I'm just, uh, I think this is gonna be a battle that's gonna start brewing. Uh, it's just starting up now. How many housing units are you gonna start allowing to be developed in the agricultural area? And then after you get so many, it's like, well, they're already here. Why not continue to change the, the look of the valley? Um, I heard one grower say that there are a number of uh, greenhouses that aren't being used and that perhaps in the future, if medical marijuana becomes legal here, that they may be used to grow marijuana. <laughs> Thoughts about that? Hmm. <laughs> I haven't heard well, that. Well, <laughs> you know, I, I, again, if it's legalized and it's available and it's allowed, it's a crop, you know. So... <laughs> Goodbye here. So well, let's get on to the issue of the future. Uh, yeah. Any thoughts about how the future will be and what the makeup of the population is and whether we're having just the right amount of gentrification or too much or not enough? Hmm. Let me put my uh, crystal ball here in front and start working the crystal ball. Now, well, you've got kids growing up. I, I in do. The and, and I, was, I don't, so I would say, it's you more know, of an it, issue for funny. you. You know, the, the, all three of my sons. <laughs> Grew up here, went to school here, um, have graduated, uh, and one son lives in Oxnard, the other lives in Jacksonville, Florida, but that's where he's based. And then Kevin is here at home right now going to CC. But the reality is, uh, 
it, it's going to be expensive to live here wherever you, you know, we're near the coast. Can we're we do anything in, about it? Can we? No, I really don't think you can, to be honest with you. I mean, it, again, are we going to start subsidizing housing for everybody? You can't build your way out of it. I can tell you that. Um, whatever you build, it'll sell at market rate and whatever the market will bear. And with a lot of retirees have lots of money, they're going to keep coming where they like it more and spending the money. I don't see how you can stop it. Well, and do you see any trends for the future? Trends for the future. I suspect we'll keep trending about what's happening now. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I just, we have um, housing values that have gone up. They've taken a couple of dips. Yeah. Uh, they've gone up again. And uh, even in my neighborhood, I've seen the, the flippers come in when there's been a, a house that they could grab for mm -hmm. A low amount of money, but on the other hand, they have fixed them up very nicely and then resold them. Um, you know, again, for for me, quality of life is something that is important, and I would hate to see our housing stock just deteriorate. Uh, I don't think there's any way you can determine who's going to be in a particular house. There's a lot more kids moving back home and staying at home. Mm -hmm. I'm recurring again. Can you say that again? <laughs> I agree. <laughs> what was it? I'm recurring again. Oh, I say, I've always thought that, that all carpentrians at some point should be furloughed out for six months or a year because they'd come back and they'd really appreciate what they have. <laughs> that is so true. That is so true. Um, how about weighing in on some of the uh, open spaces that uh, projects that have been done uh, in the last 50 years, and um, and as you well know, it's the Bluffs, the Marsh Park, the Franklin Trail, and so forth. But would you care to talk about any? Uh... Oh, I'll tell you the Marsh. A great example. Uh, I mean, and again, this is before. This is in the early 60s. I was just a kid then, and I remember my parents talking about the Marsh being dredged and a harbor put in there, and condominiums <laughs> built all around it. Um, and fortunately, that didn't happen. You know, I mean, it, what a what a loss. I, I had, a, I'm trying to think who it was. My brother, I think, was painting over there. And he saw all these fish, all these fins swimming in and around the marsh. I said, well, you know, that's one of the largest habitat spawning grounds. And, you know, they used to be all up and down the coast, all these, these yep. marshes. Yeah, for halibut. Over for there. halibut, right. shark, and, yes. And, they're gone. You, you think about what happened down at El Segundo, down in the, uh, what do they call that area where Hughes Aircraft was? And, mm -hmm. and the, the Bologna the, uh, Wetlands, I SKG think. SKG Productions, they bought all yeah. that and kept a portion of it, but that used to be all marsh. It's all disappeared up and down the coast. So, so we've had a successful marsh project? Very successful marsh project. And again, a stewardship uh, combination with homeowners, uh, Sandyland Cove, uh, UCSB, the city of Carpinteria. Um, you know, there was a time where it was partially filled in along Ash Avenue. All the backfill kept going yes. in. They were going to start developing over the top of it. Yes, uh, in fact, there's a very good video okay. by a, a videographer we know named Larry Nimmer <laughs> <laughs> who, who shows all those truckloads and truckloads yes. and truckloads coming out of there. That yeah. is, that's a real eye-opener to go back and see that and the, what, the, what changed down there and, and what's there now. And it's just, uh, well, it could have happened. it's a treasure for yeah. the community, as is the bluffs and, and so many of these special places that we have for a small community. We've done really, really well. That doesn't mean we should stop. I think no, still no. opportunities are out there, and um, you know. And we've had some outstanding people in this community, like Matt Roberts and all the open yes. spaces. Do you, do you want to mention any of the other outstanding folk? Uh, oh. There's so many of them, you'd Gosh. almost yeah hate to leave them it, out. It, it, I have to say, that our staff, and Donna's testimony to this too from day one, the staff we have at City Hall, everybody work so hard, it's not a job. They take such pride in the community and everything they do, everything. Um, Ann Myers came, uh, I was in there the other day, and she goes, oh, you gotta come see this. <laughs> uh, they just got together and created some new glassware that they were gonna sell down at the beach. I'm like, ah! <laughs> and she was so proud of it. She goes, you know, people are gonna love Carpenteria because of this. And, and, uh, but 
every little detail from the, the triathlons to the parks to the uh, the guys that work in the maintenance department, maintenance way guys, uh, they take such pride in all their work, everything they do. And I think that shows, I mean, that's just one little group in Carpinteria that really cares about the community. Then you start looking at all the different clubs that are here. Mm -hmm. You look at Carpinteria Beautiful, and you look at everybody's taking such pride in the community. It's not, and that's what's special. I yeah, think. it is. Really special. And, and I think the Carpentry Valley Association deserves CDA, a lot oh, of do. credit. They Low Seidenberg. They actually predate yeah. City uh, they do. also. They do. And um, they have been active. They were quiet for a while, I think, they because did. they they helped the three of us get on the council. Yeah. And, and uh, they are much more active again today. And I'm glad to see that because they, they, are, they are not. Needed. What I call a special interest, their interest is to me the valley, the, mm -hmm. the people who live here, and that's uh, that's such a nice thing. Donna, mm -hmm. tell me about Carpentry of Beautiful. Uh, what is it, and what are some of the projects they do? It's a um, all volunteer organization started in 1992 mm -hmm. to uh, promote wow. beauty in the community and civic pride. Uh, and we get into all kinds of mischief. <laughs> <laughs> positive mischief. From, Very yes. positive. Though. Positive it's mischief. So uh, we look for specific things that will help beautify the community, like mm -hmm. the murals that are downtown, uh, the, the uh, tile murals. And uh, we talked John Wolbrandt into doing his mural and, and uh, helped get that done. And we do some very easy things like pick up trash and, and try to keep what? the streets I clean. Say, that, I, I marvel <laughs> at that. More, I, I see the cart beautiful folks all over town. And, and I hope people really appreciate in town what they I do. I hope they do too. Be because yes. they're, the they're unsung. Un they're unsung heroes <laughs> yes. picking yes. up the trash <laughs> everywhere. Our community is so trash free. And like I say, I, I work all over from East LA all the way up to here. And it's incredible how how really well maintained our community is. And it's because no, people of people care. People. And you can do that in a small community, yeah. you know, a small yeah. number of people can make a big change. Yeah. And that's that's what makes it so rewarding. Mm -hmm. Now what are some of the other things Carpentry Beautiful has done? The home and garden tour? Home and garden tour is the uh, way we, we showcase the community mm -hmm. and uh, it's, it's nice simply because of the, the generous people that open their homes and allow the rest of us to go through mm -hmm. and look at them. And uh, it's also a nice fundraiser for Carpentry Beautiful. So that money will be turned around and put back into projects as we think of them. And um, you know, little things come up sometimes, like the little ping pong table at the beach. What a fun oh. thing that is, you know, to go down and see people playing. And, I think um, you were also one of the first people to bring out reusable bags for your groceries and things. Oh, ah, yes, yeah. we did. We really fought that yeah. battle. Um, and Let's yeah. start that over. Can you, what battle oh. did you fight? <laughs> what was that? Well, see, so you can't well, do that again because now I can't think of what was that. Well, oh, the, 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 the reusable, reusable bag issue was yeah. one we supported very yeah. strongly and uh, wound up giving away about, oh, I would say yeah, seven or 8,000 oh, 8, bags. Wow. Yes to encourage people to switch to them. And then yeah. we also encouraged the council to pass the ordinance, which they did. Mm -hmm. And I think it's made a huge difference because we were out there picking up those bags, the plastic bags, mm -hmm. and having them uh, no longer in the community has been a huge boon. It's really, it's really great. Boy, do I see with. those blowing all over Camry. All over everywhere, everywhere, yes, except here. <laughs> yeah, except here. Yeah. And then no, the no smoking ban, was that oh. a beautiful thing? It was, no, it, was it, it was supported. The yeah. girls, girls, Inc. Yeah, kids came in and really worked on that. Um, we supported that because of all the cigarette butts we mm -hmm. pick up. Um, and uh, it's had, I think, mixed success. I mean, it's, I wouldn't expect that there's going to be no more smoking. It just, uh, that's gonna to have to happen over a period of time. But I think things are improved and, and you don't see people walking down the, the sidewalk smoking no. anymore. So that's no. a nice thing. And I think people are more conscientious and health conscious too because of it. And it gives a lot of folks ammunition that don't like other people smoking when they're sitting out mm -hmm. there enjoying <laughs> their, the atmosphere. So.